So I'd like to begin uh, with a reading for you this morning, and it's, I think it's, uh, you'll see how it fits as we speak, because today we're going to be speaking about the Holy Spirit a bit. Uh, and this, this is a reading from Romans 8, chap, chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, and I, I love Romans, cha- Romans 8, I think Pastor Larry said that a couple of weeks ago, that he's, you know, that's where he is too a lot of the time. So, so allow, allow me to read this to you and, and, and think about these words as, as we do, Okay. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I could stop there, couldn't I? There is no commendation for the, or condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But it goes on. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And that's who we are. We are a people who live according to the spirit. So I'm going to invite you to stand right now, and I'm going to invite our worship team to come up. And uh, they're going to lead you now in a couple of the songs of, of, of worship that are, are well-known songs, and I think that you will, will be able to express your praise. Good morning. Uh, before we worship, I just want to get you in the right mindset this morning. Um, we're all coming from different places, whether it's basking in the sun yesterday, or maybe we're exhausted, we didn't sleep well last night. Um, I just had a baby this year. He is 10 months old, and when he sees me walk into the room, his face just lights up, and his little arms go up. He doesn't say mama yet. He's still too young, but I want you guys to think that when you're worshiping God this morning. I want you, if you feel inspired, lift up your hands, um, but just have that heart. God loves that you're here and he wants to be glorified so glorify him with everything that you are this morning as we worship okay with that let's sing 10,000 reasons bless the lord oh my soul Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. 
day when my strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise Okay, so the next song we're going to be singing is Everlasting God. With this song, I need you guys to clap, okay? It's a clapping song. So I know it's a little, uh, but you got this. Okay, I want you to start. i 
out one more song. Uh, we're going to sing In Christ Alone. Stay standing for, for prayer for a few seconds, please. Father, as we, we think about that, here we stand, uh, your people. Here we stand, the ones who proclaim you. Here we stand, your servants. And Father, you, you have called us to pray for certain things, and so this morning we'd like you to accept our prayers for those things. We pray for our world. We, we pray for the people of this world, especially the people in, in areas where there is conflict and, and where people are dying who, who for s many cases don't even know why or don't understand the purposes or the reasons. We especially think of, of course, the people in Ukraine, but also the people in Russia and, and some of them is, who are dying as well, many of them actually. 
And, and we think of other places as well, but too many to name almost sometimes. We, we pray for our world and, and what we've done to it as humans. And, and we look at the creation, the wonderful, beautiful creation that's there and how as humans so often we have, oh, what's the best word, made a mess of it? But that's what we've done. Help us as Christians to be aware of the fact that we are living in your creation and it is yours and it was beautiful. And help us to, to understand what we need to do to not make a mess of it any more than it already is. Father, we pray for our country. We pray especially for our queen, uh, one who has been a good example of faith in many years. We pray for our leaders, for their well-being especially, but, but that they would make good decisions for this country and for the people of this land, and especially that, that they would make good decisions for their own soul in the end and come to know you. We pray for our church, from, from all the congregations as they're at family camp and for those that are here uh, in all the congregations as well. We pray especially for our elders this morning as, as they're making decisions about the future of our church in some ways. In, in what we would best call strange times where, where things are changing, the, the grounds are shifting underneath us and, and to know what to do. And, and that same prayer also goes to our other churches in our community that proclaim the grace of Jesus. Uh, help, help them as well. We cannot afford to lose any of them. We need them. Father, we pray especially this morning as we speak that, that we would see a new infilling of the Holy Spirit in the, in the hearts of each one of us here, including myself. And, and that, that there would be a sense of just what a wonderful gift uh, the Spirit is to us. And so, Father, I pray for the message this morning that, that no matter how, how your, infallible, or your fallible servant stumbles over words and, and things, that your infallible message will come through. Uh, we pray that your hearts our hearts will be open to your heart as you speak to us. And so, Father, infill these words yet. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So, uh, as you can see, uh, today we're going to be considering our third and last message from the book of Joel. Uh, and, and I'll just say to you as we start that we're not going to have worked our way all the way through the book of Joel. We'll, you know, and, and so, so please feel free to read the rest of the parts that we, didn't, we don't get to in these three messages. In particular to today, though, we're going to be looking at verses that I would consider the golden text, the golden text of Joel. And, and as I was preparing this message, it suddenly struck me that some of you may not understand that term, the golden text. So, so let, let me define that for you. When this term is used, it's usually used to, to refer to a brief brief passage or, or even just a few verses chosen from out of the, the, the whole text as, as sort of embodying the thought. You know, they, it encapsulates the, the message in that passage that's critical for us to take away from the text or, or in this case, the book. And so what I'm saying to you is that here are the words that we need to take away from the book, especially. So what is it that we're gonna be looking at? So we're gonna be looking particularly at Joel 2, 28 to 32, and, and so we'll call that, at least in my mind, the golden text uh, as we look at it. However, before we look at those verses, it seems to me that it would be wise to revisit a, a few select verses that we have previously looked at. Uh, and, 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 you know, and I don't like to stand here and say, well, we're, we're going to look at the last couple, and then, you know, and then review from half the message what we'd already talked about, and some of you are going to say, yeah, I heard it before, right? Uh, that's not what I want to do. But it is important for us sometimes that, that we do sort of look back a little bit so that we can remember the flavor of what was happening when these texts came up, and we can picture the context a little bit. So, 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 so let, let me allow, allow me to do that at this point. So previously in the book of Joel, Right? You've heard that kind of thing, haven't you? you know, TV or something. Previously in the book of Joel, we're going to look at Joel uh, 2, verses 10 and 11. And uh, here's what it says. And it's talking about, about this. Okay? Before them, the earth shakes. Who's the them? Who's the earth shaking in front of? Come on, some of you were here when I, when I gave that message two weeks ago. Who's the them referring to? 
Okay, locusts. I'll, I'll answer the question myself. See, somebody knew the answer. Locusts. Before then, the heavens trembled, the sun and the moon were darkened, and the sun, sorry, the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? And, 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 you know, and you can picture these swarms of locusts coming through, right? The locusts have destroyed all the vegetation in their path, including the grains necessary for the fellowship offering at the temple. So they couldn't even do that. And, 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 and we, we looked at how that fellowship offering, no, the fact that they couldn't offer it meant that there was a, 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 a fracture between God and his people. That his people had broken that, 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 that relationship and, and that he was upset by that. How could they ever hope to overcome this disaster? Okay, so well then, then God has some commands for them. He says, you know, through Joel, he, he tells them to, to, to the priests and the teachers to call a sacred assembly at the temple and for the people to turn back to God and, 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 and to beg him to save them from the catastrophe, catastrophe sorry, that had fallen them. In other words, to turn back to God. That's what God was saying to them. Turn back to me. And they did. And what do we read? In Joel chapter 2, further down, verses 18 and 19. Then the Lord was jealous for his land. Jealous of, of the fact that people were saying, oh, look how this is going bad for them. And took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. And then further down, as we read in the chapter, we, we see God's great generosity to the people when they returned in faith to him. And he says this, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm. And remember, we went through these a little bit with him, so that's my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. But that was not the end of Joel's prophecy. God was not yet finished speaking through him. Actually, we, there's quite a bit more, but, but the next verses are the critical ones. And he moved Joel to say these words, to provide a future, a future, a vision of it. And you know the other thing about it? This would have been an incredibly surprising prophecy for the people that were listening. In these words, we find a prophecy that would have astounded them and resonates through the centuries, even to us to today. And so finally, you say, we've arrived at the golden text. So here it comes. Ready? And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And after, sorry, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And that, those verses, there's so much to unpack in those. And we, if we really take the time to look at them, we're not going to totally unpack them, but we're just going to pull some little pieces out of them today. Why would this have been such a surprising prophecy, you could say? Well, you know, I said it was a surprising. Why? Well, there's several reasons. But we, again, we only have time to explore a few. But, but first, these verses indicate that there would be an indeterminate time in the future, somewhere in the future, that would mark a change in the whole relationship between God and humanity. Uh, previous to that time, Joel was describing only a few people, only a few people, and we're talking the Old Testament, had truly experienced the power of the Spirit of God. Some prophets, some kings and leaders, some priests, and even a few workmen when they were working on the temple, in, you know, in the tabernacle, in the desert, had actually only experienced the power of God. Or at least the Spirit of God is the way we should be saying. And often this was only for specific tasks they were doing at that moment. 
and it was for a specific period of time. One of the chief functions of God's Spirit is obviously to inspire for prophecy, whether that's instruction or warning or prediction. And here we have a promise of a personal, direct connection to the great God of the universe for everyone. That would have been a surprise, wouldn't it? I will pour out my spirit on all people. And you know, Moses had predicted this as well. He talked about this, well, pretty, he, he requested this of God. He said, uh, uh, when he's, he's talking about it, and, 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 and he said, if you love me, oh, sorry, where? Sorry, I got myself out of order here on my pages. This has been known to happen before. Uh, Moses said to, to God when he was talking to him, are you jealous for my, or sorry, to, to other people, he said, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So even Moses was saying, you know, wouldn't this be wonderful for all the people, if all could have it? And how many hundreds of years before that was this? And Moses was saying this. And here we have Joel saying that that's exactly, Moses' wish is exactly what God's going to do. He's going to put it on all people. Okay, so that's one reason this would be kind of a surprising prophecy, wouldn't it? Another, pro another reason. The fact that it would come on everyone, all Israelites, are you ready for this? Regardless of gender, age, or social class. Gender, age, or social class. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Imagine what that would have meant in a society that had become highly paternalistic, where basically only men made decisions, where only men were, you know, were, were the ones that were considered in, in, in kinds of things, which is what the, what the Jewish nation had become by that point. By the way, don't think God is that way, because he's not. But man has a way of, as many of you know, of corrupting things, and, 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 and this is the case here. Imagine what it would have meant to say that. In, in that. This, you know, this suggestion that, that, that this would happen, that all people, men and women, uh, would, would have had this, this, this great gift. You can imagine some of the listeners would have been angry. What is this? Women? You're going to let women in? You know? Uh, you're going to let poor people in? You're going to let... You know. uh, so some of the people would have been angry. Some of them would have been confused. They just wouldn't have understood. And I think many of them, probably at least half of the people listening, would have been joyful, wouldn't they? I mean, you can, we can even figure out who they would have been. It was proof that God indeed cared about women and men, both, okay? Remember, this is also a society that believed that no male was really mature enough to hold significant positions until they reached the age of at least 30. And what's Joel saying? Your young men and women. That's a change. It's, it goes against the grain of everything they think of. This was also a society that only believed the priests could truly represent the people before God, and that they were the only official spokesmen of God. And Joel is describing what would be seen to be the end to the privileged position of the priestly class. Again, quite a change. So these are very, very significant words if we stop and think about them, aren't they? Uh, third, there was a prophecy that salvation would come through faith in God. Remember what it says? For all, okay? For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. And, and, and in other words, salvation did not come because of the sacrifices in the temple. Salvation did not become because of some kind of legalistic following of the rules. We're going to follow the 613 rules and we're going to do them. That's not going to gain you salvation, folks. It ain't going to happen. And it's not going to happen because of specific kinds of religious rituals. Okay, uh, you know, as much as some of those rituals are kind of neat and I kind of like them, uh, the fact remains they're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. It's only going to come through faith. That's it. End of, end of the story. In fact, this understanding was not new. It had always been true. But somehow it had been lost by the Israelites along the way on a number of occasions. What Joel's prophecies we're, 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 we're predicting, it was predicting, it was, a, it was a changed world, a changed world. Now, it took 
hundreds of years for these prophecies to come to fulfillment. And so we must step forward now to the year that Jesus was crucified, rose from the grave, and ascended into heaven. Jesus had told his disciples that the Spirit would indeed, or sorry, that Jesus in, in verse chapter 16 had told the disciples that the Spirit would indeed come to all of them. And we read this in, in John, John 14. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and he will be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And of course, that spirit did come on Pentecost and was with them and filled them and lived in them, the people that believed. And, and what do we see? We see on that day in, 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 in Pentecost that the people of Jerusalem and the people of many lands had gathered around to see what was happening when the Spirit had come down and these people were speaking in tongues. And they came around and, and Peter proclaimed, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Ah, isn't that, you know, how that fits together so nicely, doesn't it? You know, this is exactly what Joel was saying to you, folks. Listen and hear. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. You know, that's what he's saying. Hear those words again. This is the golden text. Think about them. This is where we're at. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The significance of this prophecy in, in the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost context, is extremely important. When the Holy Spirit filled the disciples that day, as it said, as Joel had said, the power to speak the word of the Lord, to prophesy, was there before men and women, to the young and old, regardless of wealth or power. It was the end of an old era and the beginning of a new. The era of Christ's church on the earth that would finally result someday in Jesus' return and the culmination of history. We are in those last days. And that's usually what it means when it says in those last days or those latter days. These are those days. We live in that time. Oh, I, you know, I was, as I was reading and preparing for this, I, I read across, read several different things, pieces here. And I love this description that came from the, from the hand of a man named Norman Langford. He said this, what Joel foresaw was that in the fullness of time, God would scatter the knowledge of himself among his people. His word would come alive in the words of men. And then under the impact of the Spirit, many would turn to God for the saving of their souls. Isn't that, nice? Isn't that a nice way to, to, to encapsulate it? I, I, just, I just really like the way he said that. Peter's use of this prophecy at Pentecost goes beyond Joel in that he sees the promise of the Spirit to not only the Israelites, but to all people, which is what God would have intended right from the beginning. I, I th and then we go on in, in Acts, and, and, and we hear this. And then Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God would call. And we read those words, and that means everyone. That means you, and it means me, to everybody in far off in time and in space. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord when we remember that, we also recognize that the prophecy of Joel, revisited by Peter, is still a prophecy for today. It is still a prophecy for us as we sit in, the, in this church. It was a wonderful promise then, and it's a wonderful promise now. And I want to just look at it a little bit again. 
In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. That's you. That's you. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. It's true, even here among us. And what it means is that God, through his Holy Spirit, wants direct communication with us. Now, we've got to define some of that a little bit in here. Sorry, I've got to step back and define some terms. When it talks about prophecy, remember we talked about this once before. Prophecy simply means a message from God. That's what it means, okay? That's what it always meant. Now, sometimes, remember, that was to foretell what was going to happen in the future. Sometimes it was to tell, talk, and make, help people to explain and understand what's going on right now. That's all considered prophecy. God wants to speak to us. Sometimes it's through his word. Uh, we call that illumination, you know? And, and I'm, sh I'm sure every one of you has had this experience where you're reading the word at some point and suddenly it's like a light goes on, right? And you say, oh, I think I understand something here that I didn't have before. Or, or you've been worrying about something and you read and, and suddenly as you read, it just comes clear. Illumination is the term, of, that's the theological term really. A fifty-dollar word, if you want, you know, for it, and and, and and that happens. Sometimes that illumination doesn't even come out of the word; it comes other ways. Let me tell you a story. I'm 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 with my the woman I love and my my granddaughter, and we're on the beach in um, Middlecombe, Victoria, Willow's Beach. Any, anybody know where Willow Beach is? Yeah, beautiful beach, one of the nicest, probably the nicest beach on the south end of the island, and and she's down there digging. And we'd talked about, about songs for, for one of the services, not this service, but an earlier one. And I had sent out the list of songs that we were going to do. And I was, I was sitting there watching them, and I found myself beginning to sing a song. And, and I don't know why, I just couldn't get it out of my head. Just couldn't get it out of my head. Well, I've learned long ago when this happens that I better be paying attention. So we came back and we changed up the music. And sure enough, if we'd have been able to do that song at the end of the service, it was exactly the song we needed to end with. That's the kind of illumination. That's, that's a form of illumination too, isn't it? It's called listening to the Spirit. Just letting the Spirit guide you sometimes. If it seems like something, you know, if it seems like the Spirit is wanting to say something to you, you better listen. Because probably there's a reason. And I'll tell you right now, I've had that experience on a number of occasions when I was, when I was leading, you know, when I was a worship pastor. That, that I, would, I would think I had the right song. Oh boy, this is going to be great. And something in my head says, no, no, no. Wait, wait, you got it wrong. Uh, ask, ask the woman I love about some of those times. She can tell you about some of those. Because, of course, what would happen is I'd go and I'd say, well, folks, I think we're going to change this song. And the worship team would look at me and say, oh, no. <laughs> this is the one we practiced. You're going to change it now? You know? Well, I'm sorry. It just, that's the way it is. Um, it also means that you may see visions. It may mean you see, I don't want to, now I'm, now I'm treading on very difficult area because I don't want to say the wrong things and I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I have seen visions on a number of occasions. I pro think probably many of others of you have had these kinds of things where you suddenly see something happening in front of your eyes that's not what's actually in front of your eyes. And you know there's something, there's something going on. Um, I, don't, I, do, I, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want you to think I'm some kind of super spiritual kind. You know, that's not the point. Because I think this is true for all of us, okay? And I know some of you at the back are thinking to yourself, really visions? Don't you mean dreams? Because young men see dream visions and old men see dreams. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, think that if you want, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave that one pass. Okay. Um, and, and I can remember very early on, uh, a person I respected very well said to me, remember this, most of the visions that you will ever get will be visions for you, not for other people. They're for your benefit, not for other people. And I didn't take that as seriously as I should have, and I remember once, Somebody came to me and said, what should I see of this? And I had seen a vision on it, and I told him, and I realized as soon as I told him that I shouldn't have told him, that that vision, that understanding was for me. 
not for them, and it actually caused them some dis distress. Anyway, why do I tell you this story? Because you too could have these things. You too could have them. Do you recognize them? Do you pay attention when God wants to speak to you? Because he will. He will speak to you. Um, and that's what he's doing. Remember what I said, it's a message from God, isn't it? Okay. In the same way, I think of these words from out of, out of Acts as well. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. In other words, you see what I'm trying to say to you? God, God's ideas, you, and the Spirit is that link that draws one to the other. And sometimes that'll be through the word of God as you read it. Sometimes it'll be through visions or dreams. Sometimes it'll be somebody else telling you something. And that's a form of prophecy. Okay? So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all of this because I want you to understand that prophecy is not what most people think it is. It's not just somebody saying, oh, in the year 2000 or 27, such. No, that's not what prophecy is. Prophecy is a message of God for you, or maybe other people as well, okay? And that's critical for us to understand this. As I think about this, and I think about God's desire to speak directly with each of us, of what he's offered us through the Spirit, I cannot think about, help but think about how wonderful it really is. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something to be taken lightly. I've often thought that if, I don't know if anybody's ever had this, where, where they've heard the voice of God actually speaking to them, but you, you, do, you run into people who say that. The voice, I actually heard the voice of God say to me. Boy, if I ever heard that, I think I would just fall down. I, I wouldn't even know how to respond to that. That is such a powerful concept, isn't it? I, I don't know. I, it's just, but yet, what a wonderful concept it is. God comes to us in the ways that we, can, we will listen. That's what it boils down to. But here's the other thing. I cannot help but wonder why we don't see more evidence of the Holy Spirit in, the, in, the, in Christians and in the churches of the 21st century, especially here in North America. Why, why don't we see more evidence of that? What's wrong? Where is that pouring out of the Holy Spirit today? Uh, and I've asked myself that question several times, and I'm not sure I have an answer, but I, I do have some thoughts. We know that the Holy Spirit is in every Christian. That's what drew them to Christ in the first place. And no, contrary to what some people have said, speaking in tongues is not proof that the Holy Spirit is present. You don't have to speak in tongues. That's not the point. How I want, however, I wonder if some Christians, maybe many, aren't afraid of opening up and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill them and to speak to them. Why would they be afraid? Because he's going to talk about our lives. He's going to talk about the things we're doing. He's going to talk about our attitudes, our words, our actions. And he's going to talk about what God wants out of us instead. And I think that idea just scares people. Especially in a world that is so, where we value uh, independence and self-determination so much, don't, don't we? I mean, it's all, it's all about me, right? 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 And, and God's saying, no, no, no. And that's even Christians that act that way, I think, sometimes. I guess I'm saying is that many just don't want to surrender to the leading of the Spirit because they don't want to change. They don't want to change. They may not want to admit that some of the things that they accept are not acceptable in God's sight. Uh, they don't want to hear God's message in their lives and where they should be going and how they should be living. The sad thing is that they don't recognize that the closer we come to Christ, the more we find joy and hope, even, even in a world of trouble. And I guess we've also seen some people that have supposedly displayed the Holy Spirit in some questionable ways too, haven't they? And they scare us as well. You know, I think of uh, some of the supposed faith healers and those kinds of people 
and people who, who've claimed to be spirit-filled and then have fallen off the tracks. Every time we see one of those, sadly, it, I think it, it kind of makes us pull back in our spirits, in our hearts a little bit. And we can't do that. We can't allow the failures of others or the foolishness of others or sometimes the mistakes of others to draw us away from where we have to be. I could go on with this for, for a long time with examples and whatever, but you've probably heard enough of me, you know, for the most part. I guess the only thing I can do is I can challenge you to, to each one of us to say, God, speak to me. Speak to me today. I want to hear your voice. And if I hear your voice, and you mean it, it scares me to death, I still want to hear it. And if it's going to be a vision, we'll make it a good vision that I can make sense out of. And if it's going to be a dream, then so be it. But, but speak to me today. Otherwise, we have to go on living in this world, guessing at, sometimes at where we go and how we go, and what we do, and what to think, right? I don't want to guess. I don't want to guess. I want to know. And, and that comes from God and God alone. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And that includes you, folks. God speaks directly if we will listen. Let me just say one last thing. This church, as all churches, could use a spiritual revival. All of us. It's just a fact. That we start off in, on fire, and as we go, the fire dampens down. And then every so often, we need to light that fire again and start coming and chasing it again. But this much I'll tell you, if there's going to be a revival in the church, first there has to be a revival in our hearts individually. If we don't get this going first, it's never going to happen here. So it's a challenge for each one of us, including me. I'm not just laying this on you guys, right? It includes me too. It needs to be here as well. And, and this is what we need to be doing. We need to be, to be seeking out God. We have to be... be, be Searching for the things we have. And you say, well, why is it so important? Here's why. The fruits of the Spirit. If you want a life of joy, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, uh, uh, self-control, those are the fruits of the Spirit. How wonderful would it be if we could live our lives with those on a regular basis? Wouldn't it be wonderful? And, and, and then I say to myself, how much, more, how much more appealing our proclamation of the gospel would be if people around us saw those fruits as well and saw that we lived with them. How much more we could reach people for God if they looked at us and saw a spirit-filled life where we listen and we hear and we act on those things. And I'm sorry, I'm beginning to lose I'm beginning to go down. I, I'm just about at the point of putting this away and just starting to preach at you. Okay? I'm, I'm, I've got to stop doing that. But I think we can pray, can't we? Let's pray for a few seconds. Father, uh, I just ask that, that, that at this moment, my heart would be open more, once more again, to, to your infilling, that, that your spirit would just flood down at this point and, 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 and move this sometimes uh, uh, blockaded, belligerent, uh, confused mind to just, just fill this heart. And I ask that for our people here. I ask that for everyone listening at any time who, who might be hearing this message. God, we need you. We need you now. We need you to, to, to make us the people that, that Joel promised and that Peter promised, people that would prophesy, who would listen and understand and hear your message. And so I thank you that, that your promises are good and that, that, that if we allow ourselves to do this, you will open those doors. And I pray that it will start even now. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite the, the worship team up and for one last song, I'd like to invite you to stand and, and to join me as we sing. All right, we're going to be singing Great is Thy Faithfulness, so if you join us in that.
And so as we come to the end of our service, may I proclaim this benediction for you. And, and just, just so that you understand that, benediction, good words. It is good words to carry away into the week and in, into the rest of your lives. From the words of Paul, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Just, uh, as I say, a couple thoughts for you. Uh, many of our people are away. You know, folks, uh, I, I've, I've said this a little bit before. I'm going to probably end up saying it again. The church runs on volunteers. It really does. And I know we've got thin numbers today, but uh, the point remains, we need volunteers. And especially as we need volunteers in a couple of areas, we need volunteers in the technical area so that we can run the, the, the cameras and the sound system. Poor Ernie is, is, is the guy that every, every time anything, anything goes off the rails, Ernie's my go-to man, and, it's, and that's not fair. He, he shouldn't have to be you know, always at the beck and call. Um, and, and we really need people. And so if you think that you can help in any way, if you're a musician or a singer, uh, can, you, can do, you think you can do sound or, or projection or whatever, please, 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 I beg of you, talk to me. Talk to me or Pastor, Pastor Larry. Let us know. Uh, ask us what's involved. If, if you are just seriously considering it, you don't even really know, ask us. We'll tell you what's involved. And, and you will be blessed, believe me, you will be blessed if you, if you take that opportunity on. It's a wonderful opportunity. Anyway, thank you very much for coming and, and listening to, to somebody who is old and therefore has just dreams rather than, than visions. Uh, thank you for being with us, and, and uh, we will have coffee in the, in, the, in the connections room as usual. Take a few seconds to thank God before, before you leave, and do so, and then come and join us. God bless you all.